This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everyone, and welcome to what I think is our final Sanctuary Online of 2023. That sounds kind of wonderful and kind of wow, doesn't it? Um, tonight, we are here with the book club, uh, book club bookies. And as we just shared, there's a number of people who are doing December things who couldn't be with us tonight, um, but they're with us in spirit. And I would love to open up with uh, giving you some some scoop here, sharing my screen and um, giving first a big shout out and thank you to anyone um, who was able to help us during our Giving Tuesday campaign. Uh, that was a wonderful campaign as, as many of you, if you read any of the documentation, it is absolutely our intention to build a gorgeous recreation center um, in the middle of our property, kind of between the pool the uh, fire pit and the big raised garden area. And um, we had a gang of folks here, the Austin prime timers were here for a big holiday. And I think we had 40 plus gentlemen on site a couple nights ago. And I just wow. thought how cool it will be next year when they're out there throwing cornhole and throwing horseshoes and in our beautiful area. So um, we just finished doing the Posada on December 1st. So the place is lit up for the space station, no kids fell. And we had a wonderful event there um, for children and musicians. And then with all the lights up, uh, we were able to enjoy an evening as well with the prime timer. So we have been busy on site in December. Um, and then what's coming uh, is tonight's book club on Mad Honey. Bud, uh, thank you again for this suggestion. I think everyone I've heard is talking about this, has just loved this uh, many layers. And we'll get into that this evening. Um, and let's see here. Uh, Cynthia, you've got a friend living in New Braunfels. Every January 1st, we have a drop-in. It's an open drop-in. It's mostly um, for, for folks who are local. But if your friend is uh, courageous and willing to venture out, um, 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock here at Sanctuary. And it's just, it's more of a drop-in. I'll tell her about it. Yeah, so it's not like a start here and finish, but there's um, Hop and John, there's food, there's drink, and just a really kind of just an enjoyable way to kick off um, our new year. So she's definitely invited to that, and um, we'd love to have her. If you let us know, we'll make sure we do an especially wonderful greeting. I will. Um, I will tell her, yeah. And, and Joby, we, we will have people from New Braunfels. We will have people from really? San Marcos, which is right beside you, Broncos. Yeah. So she could actually meet neighbors and friends here. Well, I will invite her. She is, to let you know, she is a retired dean of the University of Illinois. Oh. Wow. Yeah, she's a very accomplished person. And she won a huge award recently from the American College of, uh, of uh, Exercise Physiology. So wow. she is. She's very, very accomplished, and be she's wonderful. in New Braunfels because her sister is a a lawyer there. But anyway, I and she's a member of the Unitarian Church. Very open minded. Very glad to be, you know, there. So thank you. I'll tell her all those things. I yeah, think absolutely. And to... Cynthia, one of us, Barb, somebody, Cheryl can um send the flyer on to Cynthia, and that can be sent on to your friend as well. It's got all the details, Good. address, Good. and things like that. We mail them out. Um, to folks who've been here before, but um, we can I'd definitely get one on an email, Cynthia, and make her feel very yeah, well. She she is vision compromised, so um, she will probably have a, a helper with her. Okay, but she's on... okay, yeah, okay. We've got thanks. room. We learned that tonight. We put 40, 40 folks on here a couple nights ago. Anyway, just also to remind you, Sanctuary at Sea is back, and we are incredibly excited we have a great um team our team that has done sanctuary at sea for us twice before is actually heading up um this endeavor so it's next november and it's a little bit longer uh let's see if we say that on here i think we're doing eight days so it's a a good chunk of time and half moon k an area where we haven't been yet to, to enjoy that and of course um we're hoping for 40 people for tom and ken's 40th and we'll have 50th, oh, 50 fun. people 50th, for 50, 50 people. Fifty. You look so young tonight, Ken. Sorry. I just <laughs> took 10 years off oh, your life right there. So sweet. <laughs> um, so plenty of information coming up um, with this. As again, Barb is back in the swing of sending an email probably every two weeks now for things that are up and coming. 
Um, we will be reminding folks of one year end opportunities for giving and also reminding folks of the drop in um, with our next email. And then um, she's got a, an email teed up, I think, for the first of January, Barb, right? That does a what's happened at Sanctuary. And we'll share yeah. some yeah. photos of the Posada and some photos of um, the prime timer. So just to let you know, we are busy here, um, both, yeah, we call it now, both online and on site. And so, Cheryl, you ran a birthday fundraiser. I ran a birthday fundraiser. I think Kim's running one right now. Any and all that support, um, please know we are putting it <laughs> to good use. Um, regarding that, I'm going to stop my share and hand this um, good-looking group over to you tonight, Cheryl. And um, I look forward to listening into this uh, amazing and rigorous conversation. <clears throat> Thank you, Joey. And thank you all for participating. And I think we've already assessed that this was uh, quite some book and it had a lot of avenues to, for discussion, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know that the trans one is a big one, um, but also the bees that uh, took place. And also there's some issues around, um, you know, even lawyering as well as uh, oh, issues around, uh, um, you know, whether you know, somebody can, you know, be, can, can they can change if they've been, uh, you know, uh, uh, abusive, those kinds of things. So there's all kinds of stuff going on here. But um, general impressions of the books and what surprised you? What surprised me was who done it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who done it? Yeah. You know, there was there was yeah. another man floating in that whole universe. I don't know who he was. He was Dirk. 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 Yeah. And and you know, I'm a big I mean, I don't read that many mysteries, but I've read enough to say as soon as I start reading one, I go, Oh, who did it? Who done it? Mm -hmm. So I picked out Dirk. I thought he did it. Me too. Yeah. And so yeah, that was really wonderful to see the way that was developed and have us understand oh no 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 so. yeah who well, and and that's that's a good point i mean i'm interested here what else surprised you guys but also um that's a good segue into who did you pick out i mean you picked out dirk i'm interesting who well, i did yeah dirk 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 here dirk there dirk. yeah I I didn't I didn't want to think it was Asher, but I actually thought it was. Yeah, Asher. I thought it was going to be an accident. Yeah, but just that that theme of domestic violence. Yes, that runs throughout the book, you know, and and there's no question that that Asher did inherit some of that from his father, you know, um, and I thought that was one of the things that the book developed but left wide open you know uh was really just how much of asher's how much of his father's domestic violence did he really inherit because there were definite instances when when asher was violent yeah. um you know and and so i didn't want to think it was him but i kept thinking oh my god maybe that's the point they're going to try to make you know, is that domestic violence cycles through generations, you know, and that um, he didn't mean to do it, but maybe he did do it, you know, so I was really relieved mm -hmm. that it wasn't Asher because I really liked Asher and I wanted him, you know, not, yeah. not to be the person. Kay, Kay, you picked Dirk too? Yes, I did. I, w I thought maybe it was one of the... Um... One of the fathers. Oh, you know, I kept going back to that, but then there weren't any, there weren't any cars there, you know, um, no tire tracks, no, and people would have seen that. And I thought, huh, I wonder, but I especially thought that her father could have snuck yeah. in there and done that, you know, um, but I, I just thought, hmm, I wonder if that was it. Dirk came to my mind too. And in fact, it was really weird because, uh, Maya came to my mind as well, just for some of the things that she yeah. said. Um, I just thought, huh, I I wonder if, you know, how much she really was into, because it just 
especially towards the end, they started developing how much she really cared for and cared about Asher, you know, and yeah, yeah. Uh, it just seemed like it was, it was a behind the scenes thing, but she, she wanted him for herself, you know? Yeah. And um, so that was out there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, interesting. So was that the biggest surprise for you guys? Mm -hmm. The book? Anything else surprise you? I was surprised how adept Asher was at making love at that age. How did how did he figure all yeah. that out at oh, yes. good point. 17 yes. or 18 years old? I thought, no, I didn't even know how to kiss at, at that exactly. age. Exactly. That's a that's a great point, bud. That I, is a great point. Is. I I I didn't realize how how much that impacted me until you just mentioned it. But this boy who was so gentle yes. and so uh, aware, you know, when he was making love of yeah. his partner, and usually, you know, an eighteen year old boy is just you wham know, bam, thank you, man. The it's all yeah. about the hormones, right? You know, and personal gratification. Uh, yeah, and just the just the, that sensitivity that he had, and I thought his mother was really the source of that. You know, I, I think she she and her life experience of having survived all of that abuse and everything, and then her her awareness about bees and that that communal depending on each other kind of thing that she shared about the bees, you know, over and over again, that some of how, somehow that got into him, yeah. you know, and, and that made him that gentle, very sensitive, aware lover that he was. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. I, that, that you, th that you, th you see it coming from the bees, you know, or from her, uh, you know, cause there's a lot of stuff in there about the bees that were was, you know, symbolic of some of the stuff that happened in the book, right? Yeah. And, um, can anybody think of anything in particular that was a symbolic thing in the with the bees? Well, I have to be honest and back off on this because I was so interested in who done it yeah. that, that I just I have to admit. I just would gloss over the B thing and say, Cynthia, you're going to read this book again. So <laughs> this time, let's not try to understand the bees. <laughs> <laughs> I did. So, and I will read it again. I really will. Yeah. Well, I, I was kind of like you a little bit, even with the, uh, the trans stuff. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I kind of know this stuff, but I don't know it that well, but I got to get to the whodunit thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, the so, trans uh, part I was fascinated with. Just yeah. fascinated. I, just threw myself into it. it was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I, uh, one of the things that was, might've been somewhat symbolic is, you know, here she is taking care of all these bees, taking care of Asher. And one of her, one of her hives gets attacked by a bear. Right. And so knowing that in all likelihood, I mean, it's almost impossible for them to come back. She still goes out there and does everything in her power to save those bees. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is that about? What did you find? I think she was, she's such a protagonist in this book. Um, she's the person who's always trying to make everything okay um uh for everybody um you know and and that's that's so typical of an abuse survivor you know abuse one of the one of the major characteristics of abuse survivors is that they they try to create a world that is perfect you know mm -hmm. they try to create uh, a, a place to live where there is no danger and no suspicion and, and you know and and so I, I felt like that was part of just what came out of her. Um, and then, though, the other thing we talk about, the symbolism of the bee, Cheryl, you know, toward the end of the book, um, when she talks about right when it, it felt like 
her whole world was collapsing. Everything she was trying to, you know, she was just running to try to keep everything in place, everything perfect, everybody happy, all of that. And then it just all collapses. And then there's that section about what happens when a bee colony literally collapses, mm -hmm. when it just all of a sudden it just dies and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you know, and, and it was like tragic, you know, to read that. I never heard that about bee colonies, you know, that they could just literally practically overnight just die. Um, you know, and, and I felt like that was, you know, that was symbolic of what was going on in her world, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, I, I I hadn't thought of it that way, but it sure it sure that's right exactly. The whole thing collapsed. Yeah. yeah. And what about when you're mentioning the domestic violence and the abuse and the survivor of that? Do you think it was? I mean, how did you feel about her hiding all of that from Asher? Was that a a good thing? Is that you know did that contribute to uh, some of his issues or what do you think? I think, I think so. it contributed to some of his issues. That's my mm -hmm. opinion. But mm -hmm. you yeah. think if she had shared it more openly that he may have been more, had more ability to deal with it? Well, I, I was just going by the fact that my sister, my struggle with a, a daughter you know, addicted, et cetera. And um, uh, she was very active in Al-Anon. My sister passed away, by the way, last month. But um, Oh, so sorry. Yeah, my sister, oh. uh, she had severe dementia. But anyway, before that, and Jane said to me once, while my father was still alive, which he died in 06, she said, I said something and she went, I said, well, we don't have to tell dad. She went, no, no, no. Uh, 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 Cynthia, I've learned uh, secrets are no good. Right. Any any secret is no good. Mm -hmm. I went, well, Dad doesn't. She, and she explained it, walked right through me with it, with me, with through it. And I, I always, I, I even said that at her funeral. So Jane understood that secrets are not good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I came back to when I read this in the book. It was like, whoops, oh dear. Yeah, we're going down a dark path. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's no light on this path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a ton of secrets there, weren't there? Yes, and um, everybody had them. Yeah, <laughs> everybody. And did you? I mean, I always think you know. There's everybody's got secrets, obviously, and so on. But uh, do you ever? in your own life think that there's a difference between a secret versus uh privacy i mean how do you determine that did you feel like there was any moments in here that their secrets were actually privacy and not secrets well this is where i felt that ken has given us direction in the books and things as he's written because I have friends, he came to Chicago and did a seminar on, on marriage and they were just getting ready to marry. And he said, we're having trouble now that the rules have changed because we were all taught, to, we grew up with secrets mm -hmm. and we don't share with one another, you mm -hmm. know, the way we could or should. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's part of the work you did on marriage, Ken, and I yeah. always appreciated that because yeah, you're right, I we all grew up telling lies. Yeah. Yes, and and we were we were taught to do that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, and and when you are a, as particularly when you are the victim of abuse as she was, or when you are a person who has a secret, a secret like many of us did. Yes. Um, you know that that you realize if anybody knew this, it would change the world. You know, for it me, Every, my world. everything yeah. would change. You know, then we become so adept, you know, at at keeping those secrets and and so forth. And but Cindy, it's you know, like in in the recovery programs, one of the sayings is we're only as we're 
we're what is it? We're we're only as sane as our secrets. Oh, no, we're only as sick as our secrets. We're ah. only as sick as our secrets, you know. And so it's the secrets we keep, you know, that that uh, keep us from being able to to relate authentically to other people, because um, we're always pretending to be somebody that we're not. Yes. Um, you know, so other people don't ever have the opportunity to know us. And that was one of the things that was going on between her and, you know, and and uh, and Asher and between Lily and Asher, you know, there was there was this intense, authentic love and devotion in all of those relationships. But there was always a secret that was contaminating it, you know, at some level. Um, you know, and so, yeah, that's right, Cindy, in, in all of my work with in relationship stuff, and in my book, I talk about this a lot, you know, is is that it is those secrets that keep us from being able to communicate authentically yes. with anybody else or to have an authentic relationship, you know, with with anybody else. And 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 in this book, those it, the, just the pain in those relationships was always there because somebody was keeping a secret and they knew they were keeping it and they knew it was hurting the relationship and they wanted to tell the truth, but they didn't think they could because they were afraid of the repercussions. And then when they finally did, it turns out they were right, you know, that, that it really did harm the Cause repercussions yeah yeah and so so the i think that the the lesson is just don't start it to begin with yeah you know because the farther you go with it the more destructive it eventually is going to be you know one of the things that i felt like was a privacy issue not a secret in the book was when they asked asher were you up you know they didn't say you were you up in her bedroom or whatever right he was up in her bedroom from other things but he didn't reveal that no. that was privacy you know mm -hmm. to me that was it had nothing to do with what happened however because he held it they used that against him right they didn't consider that to be a privacy issue about something completely different than what had happened that mm -hmm. that particular day right right uh, but but that in itself was to me that was a privacy thing. That's none of their business that that had happened or gone on, you know, um, versus a secret. But um, yeah. but still used against them. And what about both of them had poor relationships with their fathers, both Asher and Lily, right? There were some parallels there in I mean different ways of it being, but some parallels there. And then some parallels in the fact that their mothers had protected them and become their their primary um, primary parent, obviously, um, or only parent almost. Um, did you see anything in particular about that they were kind of the same that way or how that impacted their relationship or... Well, both of the fathers were abusive. Um, he, Lily's father was abusive and because he didn't want, I mean, he was totally uncomfortable with <clears throat> Liam dressing like a girl, wanting to be a girl, um, and hit him and or did several times where they actually hit him. Um, and the same was true for for. Asher's father, in terms of he threw him at the point that he intervened <clears throat> to protect his mother, he threw him against the wall. So, I mean, they both experienced violence. So there, were, in some ways, while it was a secret, it was also um, Lily's experience was that when she did disclose to someone, she, I mean, she was violated several times. So, I mean, there was, there's a, there was a reason um, to not even though as she came to, to love Asher, she was, um, you know, moving closer to being able to do that and did that. But um, for those of us who haven't experienced that, where people take who we are and commit violence against us, it's it's much harder to just say, oh, I'm going to tell everybody because 
it's yeah. not it's not easy. Yeah, not. So they both came from that kind of background or experienced that kind of stuff. And what was Lily's response to Asher when he did do a couple of things that were of violence or, you know, jealousy motivated or whatever, but grabbed her or pushed her or yelled at her or whatever, you know? How did she respond? Didn't she just back away? And yeah, I was going to say, she seemed afraid to me. Mm -hmm. Do you think she was afraid because she thought that this might be something that was going to happen again to her? Mm -hmm. That's that's a typical victim's response. Mm. Uh, you, you know, it is to try to keep everything on, uh, you know, on, uh, keep an equilibrium. Don't do anything that will upset anybody. Uh, under any circumstance uh you know and so when a when a victim of abuse is abused again you know um with un unless they're in recovery and they understand what's happening to them the, the the typical response is just to try to minimize it and to keep it on a level let's just everybody calm down now let's just everybody you know everything will be okay everything's okay um you know even if it's not uh, yeah, uh, you know, so yeah, I, I do think that was the other thing is this love affair between Lily and Asher. My God, you know, that's Romeo and Juliet quality stuff. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. you. Right. That is just it that, was I mean, wonderful, wasn't it? Was it? Beautiful. Yeah. Just I yeah. love that relationship yeah. you know, between the two of them and the fact that they were both survivors of abuse, you know, mm -hmm. and they found each other. And we're able even to get to that level of intimacy and trust and love and so forth. I, I just found heroic, you know, yes. really heroic. Those two characters to me were yeah. really heroic characters. Yeah. What What did you, I mean, remember when Asher went and, and Lily went with him to see uh, the father, father Braden's new family? Right. And they got up as close as to yeah. the window almost. And um and he backed off. He got yeah. freaked out, you know? And um do you think I, he uh, what, what did you what do you think, bud? I, I didn't understand that. Um he he saw how good they looked and how what a normal family was normal, like. Normal, yeah. Did you guys feel the same way? That you felt like that he saw something normal and he... I thought he saw something normal, but I thought that he was viewing it inappropriately. Not, well, there's no wrong, anything wrong with someone's feelings, but you know, it just felt to me like, oh, you really don't understand. This may look one way, but this is an abuser. That was my thoughts. I don't know if I was what they wanted to portray or what. Yeah, I, th I think the secret to understanding why he did that was in his anger there. He didn't get sad when he saw it. He got mad Yeah, you know, when he saw it. Um, so I think there was like a resentment of some kind, um, you know, in there. Um, I didn't, I, I agree with you, but I didn't really understand it either. Those emotions right there were very, very confusing. But, but, but I, I, I did realize that I think if I had seen that, I would have been sad because I would have thought I could have had that, or this is what I missed or something like that. But instead he was angry. Um, and, and, and and it may have been it may have been coming from the same place, you know. I missed this. I, I I never had this, but I agree with you. That was just that was a very confusing thing to me as well. And isn't that when he drove a hundred miles an hour on the way yes. home? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That was scary. Yeah. He and he was he was incredibly angry and he didn't know how to deal with it. But I also remember him saying, turn around, turn around. He wanted to see the woman's face oh, right. and see 
if there was the same kind of face as you know as when mother. as his mother right. yeah and right. so um i i thought you know he couldn't tell that and he didn't know that and and he was afraid to find out almost you know but yeah. didn't want to didn't even want to deal with it you know it was i don't know it was kind of weird that he was so angry about the whole thing but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how were you introduced to this book? Uh, my best friend, Pamela, she's um, she's in a book club. Okay. And, uh, she gave it to me. And I've read it twice. And wow. new stuff every, the second time, all kinds of new stuff. Because I, like you, I was reading it to find out who, who did it. And I, yeah, I just yeah I'm, I'm, so I'm going to do that again. I, I want to know about the bee thing. I want to understand that much better. Well, that's really complicated. And it my is. best friends here around the corner are beekeepers. And I gave it to her and I said, and before she could read it, I said, I need it back because I have to read it again. <laughs> so um, I'll give it to her probably tomorrow. Yeah, good. Yeah. So. But one thing we haven't talked about at all was the way the book was written, you know, with this, you know, Olivia moving forward and Lily moving backwards and backwards, not just you know, just getting further and further and further and further back, you know, and uh, still secrets being revealed further and further and further back. And then the other one moving forward. How did how did that impact you from seeing, first of all, the two different narratives, but also the forward and back? What did you. What did you think of that? Well, I I just I. I thought that it was a way of the author to keep this complex plot going. You know, I mean, it was comp a very complex plot. So I just thought, it's, well. It's a literary device. Um, you know, yes. it, it is, it, it, it's not uncommon, you know, for authors to do this. And you're right, Cindy, it's, it's a way to try to keep the reader, you know, yeah. really engaged um, and trying to figure out things, um, uh, you know, as opposed to a linear, just a, a linear narrative. You have one narrative going one way and another narrative going the other way, you know, and it kind of keeps you on your toes more, you know, uh, trying to, to do that. It was, uh, frankly, it was confusing to me at first in this yes. book. Um mm -hmm. And, and then I realized that's what it was. I couldn't figure out why I was confused at first. And then I realized, okay, this is what this is. Yes. You know, one story is being told, you know, going into the future and the other story is being told looking into the past. Um, yeah. You know, and so, and so once I kind of got that in my head, I was able to put my stuff aside and enjoy it. Me you know, too. really kind of, really kind of appreciate it and enjoy it. Yeah. Did you find yourself going back and checking things? I did. <laughs> now, wait a minute. What was that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go. That was something she said or something they did or whatever, you know. I had to go back and yes. check it. it. It took me. Sometimes I would have to read a page or two into a new chapter to realize where I was or <laughs> who was talking even. Yeah. 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 You, you know, I, I wasn't sure, you know, is this Asher or is this Lily or, you know, who is this? Yeah. Uh, but again, I think that was part of the device to just keep you in, engaged. And it worked yes. for me. me. I mean, too. it worked. I couldn't put the book down. Oh. You know, it was it was one of those books. Sometimes it's easy for me to, to read, you know, come to some kind of feeling of, OK, now I can put this book down for a while. That was very hard for me to do with this book. Yeah, me too. Two of my favorite lines are towards the end. And um, Lisa, Lisa, no, Lily, Lily Campanella was not killed because someone was threatened by her being trans. She yeah. was killed yeah. because someone was threatened by her being a woman. Yes, yes. Oh, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And then this has always been my favorite fact about bees in their world. In their world, destiny is fluid. You might start life at, you might start life as a worker and end up a queen. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's great. 
Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. That was I mean, really I... the parallel between the bees and the people all the way through. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, was that life is unpredictable, life is wonderful, life is sweet, life is challenging, you know, and it was always the bees were experiencing the same things, you know, that right. the humans were experiencing. Right. What about Jordan and his defense of Asher and the way he carried out his defense? Did How did you experience that whole thing? At one point, Asher said he wanted to be, he wanted to tell the truth. And didn't Jordan say, there is yeah. no truth in justice? Wasn't that Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no, yeah. There, there, there's no place for truth in the court of law. Yeah, right. that, that right. uh, I, I understood it in a way, but I also found it very frustrating. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I thought Jordan's I thought Jordan's defense was, you know, brilliant. Um, except that finally, in the end, it wasn't Jordan who came up with the truth that set him free. You yeah. know, uh, which, which was the question about the blood disease. Um, you know, but I thought Jordan was. I liked Jordan. I just thought Jordan was a really honest, good person. Um, you know, I, I didn't I didn't perceive any ulterior motives in him. Uh, you know, I just thought he was a good person trying to do his best. Um, you know, um, and, and but in the end, he wasn't the person who actually saved Asher. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. He, it, I mean, and I, I haven't been exposed that much to that kind of defense type of stuff, but he just seemed a little harsh to me. You know, with Asher and with, and I know he was trying to protect them and stuff and make sure that they didn't get into, you know, any trouble or cause issues for the defense. But it seemed really, um, he seemed frustrated and angry in a lot of places, you know, um, with what he was doing. Yeah, I thought it was a good, it was a good portrayal of, you know, the tensions between a defendant and, and a lawyer, uh, you know, where the lawyer is trying to say, I know what I'm doing. Listen to me. Yeah. You know, and, and the defendant is saying, no, I want to do this. I'm going to say that I'm going to, you know, and it was that frustration <laughs> that you're talking about there, Cheryl, you know, that led, I thought that led to Jordan's anger and frustration was he just yeah. couldn't get these people to listen to him. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and I, I have been in some of those situations, you know, I've been an expert witness in several trials and 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 things like that, you know, where lawyers just couldn't make their clients listen to them. Um, and, and so I thought, you know, that he probably was a very competent lawyer, really doing his best. And these were just such, well, these characters, first of all, were so they were so individuated. They were so elaborately, they were just all bigger than life to begin with. You know, they were yeah. just amazing human beings, you know? And so, you know, that they're going to be the kind of people who are not going to want to listen to somebody. They're going to think, yeah. you know, they know what's best um, all the time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I actually, I just liked him. I liked Jordan. Yeah. He was one of my favorite yeah. people in the book. Yeah. How did you guys respond when you found out Lily was trans? Did it surprise you? Uh, yeah. Totally. Big surprise. Yeah. Yeah. But I was also wondering if Lily's mother was a lesbian. Mm. At one point, she said mm. something about, oh, what was it? She, because she liked the outdoors and she didn't like, yeah. I think, Oh, yes, yes. Yes, I agree. As a, as a woman, I really said to myself, this woman is, uh, yeah. if she isn't, she might be a wannabe. Yeah, I, I, I thought about that too, yeah. But, you know, it's so interesting because the, the world of trans people, um, you know, as a pastor in, in, in all three of the MCC churches that I pastored, there were trans people that I knew were trans because they shared it with me, but nobody else knew they were trans. I mean, you literally 
you know, there are people in, in our church here in Austin who are trans that nobody knows. Really? really? Trans. Absolutely. Because she went through the therapy and the blockers and everything before puberty. And then, so here is a trans woman who you, you, you could not tell. They said even gynecologically, you know, you could not yep. tell that she was a trans person. That shocked then me. You have, then you have the, the men who are six foot two, you know, born biological males, um, you know, with their gender identity as female. And, and you know, their makeup is terrible and their wigs are terrible and they don't know how to dress. And, and so you know that they are trans, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. So the world of trans people is so different in that way. Yes. Um, you know, and so with Lily, I just didn't, it, it never occurred to me until that moment. Um, you know, so yeah, it was a, it was a big shock to me. And then the, there's a very important, I thought one of the major themes in the book um, and I just looked up this passage is on page 217 is about the difference for people who are able to pass. You know, this says right. there's a thing called passing, which is not only about transgender people, but about everybody. Yes. Uh, it has to do with the way the bigotry and meanness of the world get parceled out based on how you might or might not look or act like everybody else the way there's a um, the way there's a particular kind of anti-semitism that gets leveled at people who look jewish whether they are or not african americans with darker skin sometimes are are on the receiving end of more bigotry than people with light skin uh, gay men who act gay get treated one way while the others do. So there's that whole phenomenon of passing. Yes. It's, it's like everybody has a secret. Going back to, to our conversation about secrets, you know, everybody's got a secret. Can you pass? You know, can you get by, you know, with your secret? Or do you suffer in this world, you know, because of your secret? Um, so I, I felt like that was a big theme of the book. Um, in, you know, was was the fact that Lily was trans, but she, it was not a problem for her, yeah. you know, and right. it just brought to mind to me what a problem it is for so many trans people. Oh yeah, and 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 so much not a problem for her that she wanted to just be a woman and yeah. not have to yeah. participate in the trans. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, groups at school or whatever, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, yeah. you know, that's not me, you know, yeah. or, or it, you know, and then she felt guilty about it. You know, I mean, you know, when I, when Tom and I moved to California, um, we, I was the pastor of MCC in the Valley, which was in North Hollywood, over the mountains from Hollywood and LA. And what they all said was there, everybody, every gay person moved to West Hollywood and LA you know, and they wanted to march in the parades and they wanted to carry banners and they wanted to wear T-shirts and, and you know, and everything to say, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. And then when they met somebody and wanted to settle down and become normal, they and moved over the mountains to North Hollywood, yeah. you know. And so our church was full of people who didn't want to have anything to do, you know, with like gay rights and pride and all of that. And you go over the, right over the mountains into West Hollywood in LA and everybody's radical and everybody's an advocate. Um, you know, and so that kind of, it reminded me of that, you know, that in different points in our lives, we might be at different places. You know, like I'm I'm an 80 year old gay man, leave me alone, you know, just let me live my life. You know? yeah. um, and yet younger gay people, you know, are ferocious fierce you know oh, yes fighting for rights and 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 so forth um well I I just, when i was there too i just went through that with my sister's funeral because we of course were raised in a methodist church in a small town here in michigan and you know i i haven't been in the closet for years but when i up there people cautiously approached me some saying you know uh do you miss your partner who died a few years ago or and others saying, "Well, what have you done? Are you know? Do you have children? Or where are you?" It was very interesting to see it all kind of, you know, people. Uh, I mean, I've, not, I've I've been closeted for many years, but 
it, it's just, you're right, it's so different. People's understanding and, and of course, it was held in a Methodist church that now has a sign in their yard that we accept all, you're all welcome, et cetera. And that's very different. Yeah. So. Well, thank you again, bud, for recommending the book. You're welcome. Yeah. Let me ask a couple more questions if you guys are cool with it. Are you? Are we late? We're almost late, aren't we? Yeah. Um, what did you think of the prosecutor's decision not to prosecute Maya? Did you agree with it? I agreed with it, but I'm always more open to new ideas in terms of justice. You know? Yeah. I, I, I'm very sympathetic to problems that occur. And... Yeah. I agreed. Yeah. It seemed like after everything that had happened and everything that had been revealed that it just wouldn't have been, nobody wanted to be dragged through any of that again, right? No. Yeah. No. No. Including Lily's mom. In all right. Likelihood. Right. Yeah. Ava, yeah. Yeah. Well, did anybody read the interview at the end where the, you know, were uh, from the authors or about the authors? Mm -hmm. I, did. I did. Wasn't that interesting? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that. You said Ken you didn't read it? I did. I haven't. No, I you just finished yeah. the book yesterday. Yeah. So I oh, okay. And I didn't know they had recipes. I just the yeah. first time I read it, I didn't see the recipes. Yeah, this yeah. is the honey bread loaf right here. Is it really? I'm eating the honey loaf. Wow. Wow. Are you really? In the back of the book. Yes, it's very good. Okay. So you read the recipes, of course, Ken. Of course. You didn't read the interview. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. As I spotted the recipes right away. So a couple of days ago, I made the honey loaf. Oh, wow. Um, oh, cool. And how is it? How is it? It's very good. Yeah. Okay. Did you use Mad Honey? No, that's another thing we didn't talk about. What What no. did Mad Honey mean? You know, in the book uh, and in the story, um, you know that that the idea that one little time of the year, the bees make honey from a particular flower that will drive you crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was used in war times. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, as Almost a weapon. Like biological war. Yeah. yeah, as a yeah. weapon. Yeah. Yeah, pretty interesting. Interesting. Well, go back and read the interviews because did you read them, Kay? Yes. Yeah. It was quite interesting to hear their conversations back and forth about how they collaborated yeah. on the book and how they decided to work together and their just their affection for one another. And how one of them took the role of writing Olivia's part, and mm -hmm. one of them took the role of writing Lily's part, and then they would switch back and forth or edit each other's or whatever, and you know play with it. So it was, it sounded like it was a very interesting yeah. collaboration, you yeah. know. Um, Plus, they each wrote the opposite one that they were the majority of the time they wrote. So they there's one chapter that they each wrote that was the other person. True. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, thanks, Kay. Well, what is the next book? Well, let's see. Remember all those other ones that we were talking about yes. before? Do we want to go to one of those? Or do you want to, you know, we had a whole pile of them. Uh, Diary of a Tuscan Bookshop, um, which is a memoir. The Girls of Atomic City, the untold story of the women who helped win World War II. Uh, no Man's Land, Trailblazing Women Who Ran Britain's Most Extraordinary Military Hospital During World War I. I think a lot of these books came out of having read um, our past book uh, about women who were powerful and in, in doing something else, you know. Yes. So um, The Women's March, The Sisterhood, Secret History of Women at CIA, and In Memoriam, a novel by Alice Wynn. This is the one, Ken, that you read, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. This is I. I. It's a World War One book. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful and amazing. Um, when I was so sick 
um, when I was doing radiation and chemotherapy and all of that, uh, Karen, our pastor, sent me that book to read. Um, and it was just, it, it was just a, 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 it's an amazing love story between two men uh, during World War I. And we had just re read several books about women heroes, you know, and so I thought this is a, would be a good book, you know, to kind of, to read uh, about, about that, men, yeah. you know, yeah. in war and, and so forth. It's, it's, um, you have to, I, I have to say that it's, it's a difficult book to read because there's a lot of war in it. Um, you know, but well, the love story and the, the history, I mean, there's so much about World War I that I realized that in my whole education, you know, all of our major wars, you know, about World War II and Korea, and I, you know, I knew a lot about, but I didn't know a lot about, I knew much more about the Civil War, you know, than I did about World War I. And, and so it was a, it was a really wonderful eye-opening historical kind of, 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 of thing. It would be worth the reading. I think, I think the group would enjoy reading and enjoy talking about it. Yeah. I'd like to read it. Yeah. Um, and Kay, you were the one that recommended Diary of a Tuscan Bookshop, right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that one. Um, a woman in, um, in her native country, who is a, a is a poet, and as well as having written this memoir, but she opens a bookshop in the, um, the village where she lived, and just as COVID is um, coming, or just, so there's that going on. And part of what she does is to list at for every diary entry, she lists the books that she's ordered for that that particular day. So she's ordering books almost every day, um, and it's just interesting to see the books that both in English and um, Italian and whatever else um, that she, and some of them turned out to be on my bookshelf. So I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay. What else guys? Where, what are your thoughts or your brothers here? Do you have any other ones that have come up since yeah, I'm trying to find it. Where is it? Well, I've been reading political books, and while I enjoy reading them, I do not think it's, you know, something that I think the group would want to do. I read Rachel Maddow's book, and it was very, very detailed about fascism, and I would recommend it to people to read, but it's more like taking a class in fascism. Yeah, I just got the book today. I just, I ordered it and just got it, so I haven't started it. The other book that I have uh, here beside me that I haven't started yet is The Kingdom, Power, and the Glory um, by Tim Alberta, which is about the whole Christian evangelical movement since oh. Trump. You know, we all ask the question, how, how in the world, you know, did the Christians we grew up with end up supporting Trump? And, right. and, and he grew up in, in a fundamentalist evangelical Christian uh, family. His father was a pastor. And, and this book is getting a lot of attention right now. It's called The Kingdom, Power, and the Glory. Um, and so I've got it. I haven't started it either. Uh, but I, I feel like you do, Cindy, it's, it's more of a study than a book club yes. book. Probably. And I'm yeah. also now reading um um oh she's so uh, she's so interesting right now. The Republican woman that's uh Liz Cheney. Liz oh, Cheney. Liz Cheney's yeah. book, yeah. I'm yeah. in the middle yeah. of her book. Yeah. But Is it good? Very, it's very, very detailed about what actually happened. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's important we all know it, but it's there's it's just a again a lesson in how all these people moving in the wrong, well, in this direction, she never expected, none of us did. Yeah. And she goes one by one through how they witnessed or whatever, they changed their mind and they lied and they this. So again, it's um, it's more of a study in how people move away from the truth. Yeah. yeah. But it's not really a novel. And so I, I enjoy with this group and other things, reading a novel. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why I was saying between those those two on this list anyway are probably the novels that we've got. The rest of them, yeah, uh, 
you know, might. Well, I like the idea of Ken's love story. Okay. And I think I would like. I think I would like to re really recommend it that we read it. Um, okay. We've been talking about it for a while, and uh, you know, I did have some hesitation about it because it is really war kind of stuff but the history is so wonderful and the love story is just amazing that's uh, great you know so i i think i think the group would enjoy it i do okay how about you guys good with that I yeah am. in memoriam okay in memoriam. Yeah, right. okay okay and future can you read that no Mitch album. oh a little put oh, by your um, I can't the put by your camera. Move it right in front of your face. Isn't that how's that? Yeah. Can it's you read it? No. no. <laughs> how's that? Just read the author. Lift it up a little bit. I can't I can see Mitch album, but I can't see anything else. Uh it's called The Little Liar. Oh, okay. It was on uh one of the one of the morning shows a couple of weeks ago and I think it's one on Oprah's list, but a friend of mine's reading it right now. She said it's great. So that could be future. Well, that could be something for the future. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go with um, In Memoriam. In Memoriam. And then for the date, um, both the 23rd and the 30th are near the end of January. Um, I might not be around on the 30th, and I'm wondering if the 23rd would be okay with you guys. 23rd would be fine. January. January, yeah, January twenty third, yeah, twenty third, Cheryl, yeah, that'd be good. Okay. And what'd you call that one? What was that one called, Bud? The what? Uh, the little liar. Little liar. Okay. And Ken, you're just this is called in memoriam. That's in what we're doing next. Memoriam. In yes. memoriam, a novel by Alice Wynn. W Y N N, W I I. Barb, you have that for the next. Yep, email got it. Out? Fabulous, <clears throat> got it. On twenty third, twenty third of January. All right. Well, my friends, I'm gonna I'm gonna at least stop the share or the the recording. So uh, again, a fabulous conversation. Let me go ahead and stop this share. Then we will um put this up on our YouTube channel.